amigos, una edición más de Auto 060 aquí en Cristina Radio Network. Tenemos un show con muchas entrevistas, muchas noticias muy interesantes. Y vamos a empezar con una de ellas, una entrevista con Jim Patterson, el editor asociado de Keeping Our Letter, para hablar sobre el estado en que está la industria automotriz y cómo es que vamos a llegar a casi 17 millones de autos vendidos acá en Estados Unidos tan pronto como el año próximo. Así que vamos, a we're switching now to English to talk to... Jim Patterson of the Kiplinger Letter. So now we're uh, talking with uh, Jim uh, from the Kiplinger Letter. Uh, how are you, Jim? Thank you for having the, taking the time to talk with us. Doing well, Javier. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, can you explain first to for our audience who are not uh, familiar with the publication, uh, what what, it's, uh, what does it do and uh, why are you so interested in cars and all that? Sure. We write a lot for small business owners, and we try to tell our readers about both uh, government policy, what's going to be happening here in Washington, and we also try to tell our readers about how the economy is going to be doing so they can make their business plans accordingly. And cars are a big part of the economy, and a lot of our readers are in the car industry. They're auto dealers, or they run uh, garages, or they're connected in some way to car sales. So they want to know you know, what models are going to be selling well, they want to know how many cars are going to be sold this year or next year, they want to know about new car technologies, all these things affect a lot of their businesses. Yeah, it seems that the auto industry goes, I mean, it doesn't seem, it, it's true, I mean, the auto industry goes hand by hand with the uh, economy in, uh, around the country, and uh, for a while, in the past year, two years, like, while well, the, the economy wasn't doing that well, the auto industry was rebounding very strongly, and now we're getting to a point where we're going to get a uh, to the levels of 2008, I mean, almost 70 million cars, like by next year, right? Right, we are getting close to getting back to the levels of car sales that we used to see before the recession. The recession that hit in 2008, 2009, really, really hurt the car industry. Car sales crashed back then. Uh, they were down more than 50% compared to before the recession. Uh, but since then, we've seen a steady recovery each year. And looking ahead to 2014, we're going to get back to a level above 16 million car sales uh, for the first time since before the recession. Yeah, that goes back to uh, to 2007. Yeah, it seems like that rebound in the industry, in, uh, the auto industry went faster than the rest of the economy. And I guess it's a different factor. Uh, one of them is that there's a lot of old cars down on the road, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The average car on the road today is getting pretty old. It's probably about 11 years old now. That's uh, much higher than normal. Uh, a lot of people, you know, during the recession or right after the recession, they, you know, they maybe they wanted to buy a new car, but they, they, maybe they couldn't afford it, or maybe they just didn't feel confident about the economy. Maybe they were worried about hanging, whether they could hang on to their job. So a lot of people uh, put off those sales for a long time, but you know, cars are getting older now. They're, they're starting to physically break down. And uh, meanwhile, the economy's gotten a little bit better. People are a little more optimistic. So uh, a lot of those sales that didn't happen a few years ago are happening now. So it's kind of a rebound effect. Yeah, and the, the credit rates are still low. And, uh, and, the other, and the other thing that helps is like, a lot of good offers from the cars. I mean, I don't think there's a bad car anymore in the on the market. I mean, and there are cars that you might like, you don't like, uh, but in 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 general, I mean, the quality and 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 all the technologies in cars are are pretty good. And, and even though bigger cars with bigger engines are becoming more efficient, that's another reason, right? Yeah, it's true. You hit the nail on the head. There's been a tremendous amount of physical improvement in new cars across the board, whether you're talking about you know, little compact cars, whether you're talking about big, big uh, pickup trucks, hybrids, you know, everything pretty much. Um, they look better, they drive better, there's been a lot of new technology added to cars, a lot more electronics, you know, you can have your smartphone integrated right into your car's audio system now. Uh, you know, you can be tweeting while you're driving if you, you know, if you do it through your car's stereo system. And, uh, yeah, the, the fuel efficiency is maybe the biggest change. There's been so much advance in engine technology, in uh, other mechanical systems, in the way cars are designed to reduce air resistance. So uh, we're seeing mileage now from pretty big cars that used to be not possible, except maybe for tiny little subcompacts. Yeah. So, 
you can have a stylish looking roomy feature packed car that also gets really good gas mileage now and, and people seem to be excited about that yeah gm is talking about the new corvette as being an efficient car i mean who would thought about that right yeah right who would have thought that 10 or 20 years ago uh, i heard that the new corvette uh, i don't think it's uh, on sale yet, but it's going to be hitting dealers very soon. Uh, the new Corvette's going to be rated at 29 miles per gallon by the EPA, and I think GM actually says that if you put the car in its efficiency mode, uh, it can hit 30 miles per gallon. And that car has a, a big V8 engine, it's going to have 450 horsepower, it's going to be extremely fast, but it's getting the sort of mileage that maybe 10 years ago we would have been talking about for uh, you know, a little compact uh, economy car. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to go and drive it uh, pretty soon in California. Oh, really? But yeah, I, 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 I don't think they're going to make that mileage. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just drive it the fun way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, Jim, another question about the uh, new trends here in the States. Uh, these sales are, uh, are, I don't know if you can call it a comeback because they were never very big for passenger cars. But now there's a lot of uh, uh, offers. I mean, Chevrolet also has the cruise with the diesel engine. A Jeep is coming out with the Grand uh, Cherokee with a diesel engine, and there's a lot. So you think, uh, I mean, the Germans always been like Volkswagen, Audi, uh, all that group. But uh, you think the consumers are ready for make that to make that change, even though diesel is more expensive in most of the states? Right. No, it, it does seem like there's more consumer awareness and, and more interest in diesel now than we've seen in a long time. As you said, for a, a very long time, the German car companies, especially Volkswagen, really dominated diesel. They kind of had a monopoly on the market. No one else really seemed to want to sell a diesel car. But now we're seeing a whole lot more brands branching out. Uh, as you said, the new Cruise, which I think has 46 miles per gallon on the highway, you know, which is really, really good. Uh, and as you said, the, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, Mazda is going to be selling diesels in multiple models. Uh, and meanwhile, Audi and, and Volkswagen are going to be expanding their diesel offerings. It's not going to just be in, you know, the Golf or the Jetta anymore. It's going to be across the lineup. BMW is coming with more diesels. Mercedes is coming with more diesels. So. Clearly, these car companies have done the market research, have talked to consumers, have run the numbers, and have decided that, yes, you know, there's a, there's a business case to be made here. I really think that diesels are for, are, are really geared toward you know, drivers who, who are, you know, we would call enthusiasts. They, they, they value handling and pickup, and they, they still care about good mileage. Maybe they're not so interested in a hybrid, which gets very good mileage, but might be kind of slow. There's a lot of performance-oriented diesels out there where you get a good combination of, you know, speed and fuel efficiency. So I think it kind of hits a sweet spot for those folks. Yeah, uh, yeah. we're talking with uh, Jim Patterson, Associate Editor at the Keep On Getting Letter. Uh, Jim, another thing, uh, do you have any recommendations about, uh, I mean, there's a lot of offering also between uh, hybrids and electric cars. It's, are they still worth it in your opinion uh, to, to pick them up even like for example a gasoline engine car or a diesel engine car? Right. You know, it, it's a tough call if you're talking about the value proposition because you're going to pay a premium for a hybrid and you're going to have to really do the math and, and think will I really save enough money on gas to make this worth it? You know, you're probably going to spend a few thousand dollars more for a hybrid versus a regular a conventional gasoline powered car and you know a lot of people probably would take a very long time to make up that cost in the, the fuel savings down the road um, so it, it, it's a tough calculation but a lot of people really value fuel economy even if it's not just for dollars and cents to save money a lot of people care about the environmental aspect of it and hybrids are proving to be fairly popular sellers, you know, certainly the Toyota Prius, which everyone knows about, yeah. you know, always is up high on the list of best-selling cars month after month. You know, electric cars, it's a much tougher sell because the technology is not, not nearly as mature yet. You know, they're very expensive. Uh, most of the electric cars on the market now can only go maybe 80 miles to 100 miles before we have to recharge them. They take a long time to recharge. So they're just, it's, it's hard to make the case that they're practical replacements for for cars with uh, either you know a gasoline engine or a hybrid engine or a diesel engine, which are easy to fuel up, um, 
But we're starting to see baby steps for electric cars. A lot more manufacturers are working on them. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to make the batteries hold more energy so the cars can go farther. They're trying to make the cars lighter for the same reason so the cars can go farther on a charge. They're trying to figure out how to make them a little less expensive. So I think that's a, a, a prospect for several years down the road before electric cars really break out and become a, a mainstream sort of option. Yeah, it, it was very curious uh, uh, last week when uh, the North American Car and Truck of the Year Award announced its uh, long list of candidates. There were no hybrids, but there were a few electrics. So, I mean, I, I guess it's a trend that is going to, as you say, it's going to take a little while, but it, it's happening, right? It is happening, and there's a lot of excitement around some electric cars, and I've certainly read a lot of great reviews of uh, Tesla's new electric sedan, which uh, I haven't gotten to drive one yet, but I certainly see them in the, on the streets here in D.C. It's a great looking yeah, the car. Yeah, the is amazing. The review I said, that read says that it drives really well. Um, it's, a, it's very expensive, certainly, so it's really geared toward uh, the luxury end of the market, people especially who, were, who value the technology. But there's a lot of exciting things going on. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, as I said, baby steps are being taken right now by manufacturers. And I think that that's going to pay off in the long run. Well, um, uh, we're running out of time, Jim. Unfortunately, we can be talking for a long, long time. Uh, Jim Patterson, associate editor of the Keep Doing Your Letter. Um, any word that uh, people can find out about more about your publication and how they can subscribe? Yeah, absolutely. Go to Kiplinger.com. You'll see a ton of our content there that we publish both from our newsletter as well as our personal finance magazine and other features that are just dedicated to the website. Uh, if you like what you see there, there's uh, easy links to either call us to, to, to subscribe or you can just sign up right online and get started right away. Well, thank you very much. And uh, one more last question. Since you're based in Washington, D.C., uh, what do you make of uh, the, the purchase of Jeff Bezos of the Washington Post? Uh, maybe he can put like a heat trader kind of thing for cars? <laughs> I, I, I hope he can do something because obviously the newspaper industry is uh, struggling to find a successful business model in this age of the internet. So you know, he's been a great entrepreneur in the past. He's shown he can make businesses really profitable. And it'll be interesting to see what he can do with the Post. But everybody's still kind of in shock down here. Yeah, I saw, I saw a funny post on Facebook, uh, someone saying that uh, Jeff Bezos, based on your recent purchase, you can also be interested in the LA Times and <laughs> the Times. Yeah, right. <laughs> probably got a lot of things to be on the shopping list now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jim, for your time. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon again. All right, my pleasure, Javier. Thank you. Thank you, bye. bye.